Your Life Unfiltered podcast. In this podcast, we dig deep into the life experiences of our guests, the connected dots between their early experiences and what they're doing today. Today, we have special guest, Sunny Jane. Sunny, if you want to quickly introduce yourself for everyone. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ketel and Deepam, for having me. My name is Sunny Jane, uh, based in Houston, Texas, although I am a guest in Salt Lake City right now, and just great to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Great to have you, Sunny. And uh, if, you, if you could go back a few years, you know, just early childhood, early upbringing, and just tap into some of the motivations or inspirations that, that stuck with you, that basically motivated you to what you're doing today and kind of try to relate what, with what you're doing today, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so I can talk a little bit about myself. So I grew up in Houston, uh, lived there most of my life. Um, my parents came from India uh, in the 80s. And uh, and yeah, I, I'm kind of one of the mixed uh, group of people that uh, grew up with both of a mix of Indian culture and American culture. So uh, definitely a first generation American born. Uh, I grew up as a Jane. And so, uh, you know, I went to Pachala class, and uh, which is like like our Sunday school. And kind of uh, grew up with with traditional Jane values, um, and at the same time, kind of uh, you know grew up from there. And so, uh, yeah. So currently, I'm uh, working at Goldman Sachs, uh, working in foreign exchange operations. So definitely, and um, I work more on this. All right, fantastic. And I mean, we'll go deeper into this, but you've done a lot of different things during your, you know, your life so far. But what I wanted to understand is what were the motivations behind some of the stuff you've done, right? So for the audience here, um, Sunny's actually done a bunch of stuff, in, including volunteer work for an organization known as YJP, Young Jane Professionals. He also started his own social initiative tied to veganism. So it's called Jane Vegan Initiative. Um, apart from that, he also connected a lot of people of, this, of the faith of Jainism through Global Jane Network. So you've done a lot of connecting people together. So is that something that you believe has happened through early life experiences, like that was the early motivation that allowed you to do this later in life? Or was there some kind of pattern throughout your education or something that led to that outcome? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great question. I think I always considered myself more of a introvert. So I'm someone that was very quiet growing up, believe it or not. And, uh, and I actually had a lot of trouble kind of, you know, making friends and kind of being a part of like, like a group experience. And so, uh, you know, over time, I've kind of built my confidence and became going. And I noticed that uh, whenever we're in like these, uh, you know, our community gatherings and group events, that there's a lot of people there that may feel uh, either they're shy at first or they have introverted tendencies. And my goal is to kind of be inclusive and try to bring everyone together. And so whenever I create these events and these, it's really to bring people together. And I find a lot of joy in that. Um, and that's kind of what led me to this organization where we, we connect Janes from around the country and around the world, actually, and, and try to bring them common interests and things that make them happy. And, um, and yeah, it's been very rewarding, I think, both for uh, you know, people that have been a part of these experiences as well as for myself, because I continue from uh, learning about other people's experiences. That, that's amazing. I... I actually want to ask a clarifying question to make sure I understand what you said, but would you, would you say it's an accurate statement to say that because you grew up as an introvert, you have more empathy for other people that might be introverted, and that allows you to get a lot more pleasure by knowing that you're helping to transform someone's confidence by connecting them with other people, building up their confidence, making them feel included? Like, would you say like your own personal anecdote and story behind how you were growing up that is helping you to understand how to bring people together? Yeah, I, uh, I would definitely say that. I think, um, you know, I can definitely empathize with people that, uh, that, you know, are also introverted. And I feel that, um, you know, whenever I see in, in a group, I always see that there's a few people that may not be able to speak up or maybe they're a little bit uncomfortable. And so I definitely want to kind of extend my hand out there and kind of bring them into the group. And so uh, I think, you know, if I had, a, you know, actually I had done this personality assessment as part of like one of my school programs and one of my top qualities was uh, inclusivity and that was actually like a trait where you kind of try to bring people into a group and so um, that was more on like the professional setting so whether it's in a professional uh, group you're working on a project uh, with a group of people or if it's on a social setting where you know you're just uh, a group of friends hanging out um, I think there's definitely um, a lot of 
you know, including the whole group. Um, I think there's a lot mm-hmm. of people that have a lot to bring to the table that may not be uh, open at first. And, and I definitely want to make people feel comfortable. Got it. No, that's, that's amazing. Uh, sorry. So uh, I just had a specific question around, uh, just a clarifying question, around the communities that you've built, especially the Global Gen Networks and Gen Vegan Initiative. So uh, I, I'm not sure if I, there are other communities that you've been part of, but I was wondering, you know, was there a specific motivation behind connecting the Gen people together through these communities? Uh, obviously, there was a need in the Gen, Gen Vegan Initiative area. That's the area where, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. But what about the Global Gen Network and other things like that? Yeah, I think uh, one of my, I guess, motivations and inspiration for kind of building this together is that uh, this was during the midst of the pandemic. So I, I definitely mm-hmm. saw that there was a need for uh, progressive conversations and like spaces for James to connect. I think right. we were all sitting at our houses trying to figure out um, how we can meet people, especially in the world. And of course, during that time was the advent of, of Zoom and Clubhouse and all these different apps that we're finding new and innovative ways to bring people together. Um, and I can tell you maybe two years ago, I had no idea what Zoom was. And so now, <laughs> and now it's like a, it's a staple of every household, right? Even my parents right. use Zoom. Uh, I'm sure there's even like grandparents that use Zoom. And so obviously it was a very changing time, very dynamic time. And um, I found that there was a lot of opportunities for us to, uh, to leverage these technologies to bring people together. And that's kind of what led to the creation of the Global Jane Network. Um, um, you know, there was a lot of, and I think very interesting people uh, in our community. And, you know, this was one way to kind of bring them together and kind of showcase different people in our community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And basically the timing also worked out in in a way that clubhouses happened to launch at a time and, you know, we were in the midst of the pandemic. So it was a platform where everybody wanted to be, be on and, you know, you took the perfect opportunity and just took it to the next level, essentially, just try to bring people closer together. Um, I, as well as many others uh, who might be listening to this podcast, they, they've, they've been on these uh, sessions uh, that you've organized through the Clubhouse platform. Um, I was just wondering, you know, from your perspective, what was the most, uh, what was the session, one or two sessions that really stood out to you the most, like that, that were mostly inspiring, that, that really stuck with you to this day? I know it's been a while since the last session I was conducted, so just curious to know about that. Yeah, we've, we've had some incredible sessions um, mm-hmm. over a period of about six months to a year. I think one very interesting session for me was um, it, we, we actually held a Janes and Poetry open mic session. And essentially, um, and I'll admit, I have no background in poetry. It's something I do not know. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there was a lot of people that were passionate about, like, about creating poems, whether it's either reading them or writing them themselves. And we actually created an open mic. And so what we did is, we allowed people to kind of come onto the stage. And like, for those that aren't familiar with Clubhouse, essentially there's a virtual stage. And you know, you can raise your hand and we would kind of pull you um, onto the stage and, and you can kind of uh, you know, speak on the stage, right? And there's an audience and there's other speakers and it's just a really uh, great and wonderful space that's all inclusive. And mm-hmm. um, we're um, able to share their personal you know, writings and poems it was an incredible thing and we did we actually did this like every once a week and we had new faces come in every week and we had people that regularly um you know showcase their poetry and we had people that did it for the first time and that's definitely wow. something that kind of stuck with me i thought it was a very interesting uh you know very interesting interactions and experiences and it also opened my mind up as well like i learned a lot and i've actually you know gotten a little bit more closer to that space because of these sessions so that's definitely yeah. i think one event that kind of uh, resonates with me a lot. Yeah. And actually, this goes back to one of the points that Ketul was making before, that uh, it sounds like you you can empathize with people more because of your experiences. So I think poetry is such, you know, one such avenue where people are really shy to show their work. They are, they don't really want to put it out there because they, they just feel embarrassed and things like that. But Clubhouse, as well as you, basically gave them the, the opportunity to kind of bring it out to the world again. And just be more confident in their themselves and their their art. Yeah. Um, I think the beauty of like a virtual stage is mm-hmm. that it kind of takes away that um, the intimidation that comes with public speaking. So when right. you think about public speaking, if you can imagine a dark stage and there's a spotlight on you, uh, when you come up the stage, uh, it could be very intimidating. You have eyes on you. You have people that are 
um, that are listening to every word you're saying. And it can be very intimidating. But when you're on an app like Clubhouse or even Zoom for that matter, it kind of takes a lot of intimidation from that space. And it allows, I've noticed that once people feel comfortable with interface, it allows people to open up in ways that they wouldn't in the physical real world. And, and I think there's a beauty in that because we've seen a lot mm -hmm. of people that have never, um, you know, shared their experiences publicly, being able to leverage these technologies to connect with other people. And, um, and I think that's, you know, really one benefit of uh, these platforms. 100%, 100%. That's great. I actually had a question. So Sunny, I know you said you've done some personality profile stuff in the past, right? Um, do you know if it was Myers-Briggs by any chance? And if it was, do you know what your, what your personality profile on Myers-Briggs was? My, Myers-Briggs, uh, it, it was. I would have to pull it up to remember exactly what it was. But essentially, it was a part of my MBA program where uh, we had to take like a, at least, you know, a hand, like two to three hours worth of personality assessments. And it was over a variety of different forms. And before, you know, doing my MBA, I used to always think of these assessments as, uh, more of a gimmick or something that, you know, kind of like some, you know, astrology or something that just, it was more of like, <laughs> you know, it sounded nice, but was there any really science behind it? And mm -hmm. I found out this MBA program that it was, uh, there's definitely science behind it. And one interesting thing is the reason why MBAs have to take these personality assessments and as a part of like the standard core for all these MBA programs is that, um, to become, a, to be a leader in the professional setting and in the business world, you have to be able to understand your strengths, your weaknesses, uh, your stress behavior, what makes you tick, what, what makes you uh, motivated, and really understanding yourself. And so we put a lot of time into taking these assessments, um, understanding how do I act when I'm stressed out? Uh, how do I act when I'm you know, in my comfortable, in my, my natural state? And, um, and I learned a lot about myself through these assessments. And I think one great example is um, – you know, in the particular um, assessment that I took, it's called the Berkman chart. Um, I learned that whenever I'm stressed out, I actually become distracted. And so I kind of become like, you know, cloudy minded. So I'm kind of more distracted. I'm not really focused. Uh, you know, other people, their stress behaviors may be uh, that they get angry, right? There's some people that would actually close up in a ball. And so they become like a hermit in their shell. They don't want to talk to people. And so everyone has like their own way of dealing with stress. And so for me, I'm very distracted. I'm completely in La La Land at that point, you know, and, um, <laughs> and like, I learned that, um, you know, like over practice, I was able to figure out when I'm stressed out and I'm able to catch myself. And so when I started catching myself in my stress behavior, I'm able to pull myself out. Like, all right, I, I'm probably stressed. These are uh, actions that I can take to make me uh, counteract those uh, stress behaviors. And, um, and I think that was a, a fine example of understanding your weaknesses and, um, Using that to uh, to better yourself, like especially in these high stress situations. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. So it's like it actually taps into EQ because it's self management, right? So you manage yourself better, and then also emotional management. You're managing your emotions better. Right. So that's yeah. So it's great. It's like a scientific approach to handle and develop EQ further. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, so Sunny, I want to switch gear a little bit. Um, and talk to uh, talk to you about your other uh, interest, which is you know veganism, right? Mm -hmm. So I I have to be honest, actually, I was I had heard about veganism before. I was I didn't really pay too much attention to it, and until you know I came across you guys, and and I attended a bunch of sessions after the JNI event we had last year, and it really started to peak interest in the the whole idea behind uh why veganism is taking uh you know so much uh or getting so much traction these days why is it important for us as a, as a jain community but also as a you know global phenomenon right because it contributes to the pollution and other things like that what was your journey i know we talked about it in the in the uh clubhouse sessions but do you want to walk us through your journey or how you evolved uh in this journey as you you know what motivated you how did you get started and so on so oh. Growing up, um, I grew up as a Jane, and like many other Janes, we're growing up with that idea that animals are sentient beings, that they have the ability to feel pain, to feel love, to feel compassion, and every living being has a inherent need to survive, mm -hmm. and um, and that is why many Janes uh, grow up as vegetarians, uh, myself included. Uh, 
as I kind of grew older, um, I kind of strayed away from the path of being a pure vegetarian. And just to clarify what that means, uh, in America, most baked goods have eggs in it. And uh, we, we unknowingly consume a lot of animal products. And, uh, and it's kind of a normal thing here, especially in North America. And so I remember I was at a period of time where I was just barely vegetarian, you know, like I ate everything but meat. And um, if someone ever told me that, hey, this has eggs in it or, hey, this has something in it, I would actually feel upset. Like, oh, you just ruined this food for me. Why'd you do that? Right. <laughs> so I was a very different person uh, a few years ago. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, one day I came across a video. And, um, you know, for those that are on WhatsApp, WhatsApp is notorious for uh, uncles forwarding you uh, videos and nonsense all day long. And I actually came across this video that uh, an uncle that I barely even know sent me. And essentially this video uh, showcased, um, it, was, it was a compilation of clips that happened happen to animals uh, in the slaughterhouse. And so it was a compi compilation of short clips and kind of put together. And I remember watching this video and I had watched it on mute. And, um, and I was just horrified by what I saw. You know, I felt anger, I felt sadness, I felt grief for the animals as well. And, um, you know, watching these videos made me realize that, you know, maybe I'm not doing enough, right? In my life, I'm kind of doing the bare minimum, but what's happening behind closed doors is something that I didn't want to be a part of, I didn't want to support anymore. And, and that kind of sparked my uh, transition towards eventually removing animal products from my life. And so um, I would say it wasn't all at once. This was definitely something that happened over a period of time. And so even after watching these videos, you know, I continued to, you know, pursue my lifestyle as it was. But on the back of my mind, I knew that, you know, there's something there. And, um, mm -hmm. and that actually eventually led me to uh, learn more about veganism, to do more research. And um, eventually, I began to tra transition animal products out of my life. Uh, I started off with milk. And I think milk was, uh, you know, probably the very first thing that's on everyone's minds. Uh, you know, most people will have a gallon of milk in their fridge. And uh, that's the first thing that I kind of replaced. And I replaced it with non-dairy milk. Um, soon after I got rid of milk, uh, I got rid of cheese. And I can tell you, cheese was definitely the hardest part of this whole, <laughs> cheese was by far the villain of the story. So I, you know, it was very difficult for me to do. But once I kind of overcame that hurdle, and I knew at the end of the day that I wanted to become fully vegan. And so I had that mindset. And so as I slowly began to transition out, um, I eventually moved to yogurt and butter. And then before I knew it, I had uh, completely transitioned out all animal products, uh, you know, from my life. These were things that, you know, whether it was food, food products, whether it was clothing, such as leather, wool, silk, wool, or sorry, wool and silk, uh, or if it was um, even supporting institutions that exploit animals, right? So that could be zoos, that could be aquariums, uh, you know, rodeos, anything that kind of exploits animals for entertainment. Uh, I kind of eliminated all that from my life. And as I kind of took that path, I found myself, you know, more content. I felt like my life had more fulfillment and meaning to it. I, I think um, there's a kind of a misperception that when you're giving up all these products, you're making life less interesting, it's more boring, right? Or it's more harder. But I found that after I gave up these products, the things that I do enjoy, um, I, I find more pleasure in it. So whenever I get like a vegan chocolate chip cookie or uh, vegan croissants, like I enjoy it twice as much probably. And, um, and that's part of, you know, being a vegan, you know, so we're all foodies, we all enjoy what we do. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's kind of, um, you know, what inspired me to become vegan. And mm -hmm. I realized that a lot, there's a lot of misinformation and maybe just a lack of awareness in our community. And that kind mm -hmm. of led us to um, kind of forming the Jane Vegan Initiative. Uh, our goal isn't to change people's minds, but rather it's to introduce information into our community so that everyone can make a, a, um, an informed decision. I think most Janes today don't realize that just from the food that we're consuming, how many animals are, um, are impacted by, that, by those choices. And even starting at home could save an animal life, uh, you know, in all transparency. And so uh, that is really the, the mission and the vision of our organization. Awesome. 
And I know Ketul was laughing at your cheese count because he, <laughs> he loves cheese. <laughs> yeah, that's the, I can completely resonate with the concept that is the hardest thing to give up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but I should mention that I also gave up milk after, after I got in touch with you guys and started learning more about veganism. So I, I still, uh, to this day, I still don't have like regular milk in my fridge. It's just non, non-dairy milk. Uh, and I'm a, I, I wouldn't say I'm completely vegan yet. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm still consuming a little bit of paneer and yogurt here and there, but I'm on path to being there. And one thing, Sunny, that really surprised me earlier this year, I, I actually traveled to Europe and I've always heard about uh, this thing about Europe that food is very hard to get for vegetarian people because it's just completely, you know, everybody eats meat. It's just, you know, mm-hmm. because it's produced there, right? It's just right. The, the part of their culture. So it's very hard to find vegetarian food. What I was surprised to see is that there's a lot of vegan restaurants that have opened up in the last few years, and I did not have any issues finding vegan food anywhere. Uh, and I was at least I traveled to six countries, and in any of those countries, I didn't have any issues finding vegan food. So it was uh, absolutely fascinating, and it's just great to see how the whole uh, initiative is taking traction, get, getting traction across the world, not just in the U.S. Um, and soon we'll see it in the Asia as well. That's incredible. And no, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, actually, recently uh, uh, went on a trip to Turkey and uh, and over there, uh, you know, Turkey is known as like the land of meat. It's the kingdom of meats, they call themselves. And even there, I was able to find so many vegan options. Uh, and it was incredible. I think every day I tried something different. And, um, you know, with all the, the advent of all the non um, or sort of like the plant based meats, we call it. Uh, mm-hmm. There's so many new options that were there. And I think maybe five years ago, this wouldn't have been a thing. So uh, definitely yeah. great to hear that. So Sonny, what advice do you have for someone that wants to become vegan, but finds it really overwhelming to go all in on it? Yeah, I think uh, my advice would be, um, and I, I think it's a really good question. Uh, oftentimes when we think of like the vegan lifestyle, we think of it as you know, all or nothing, right? Or we think of it as a label that I'm vegan today, I'm not vegan tomorrow. But I actually look at it more as a spectrum. I think, you know, if you can even reduce the consumption of dairy milk, they can do, you know, on a daily basis. I think that alone is one step that can help an animal life. And so I think, you know, I wouldn't think of, you know, I take one step forward and two steps back. I'd rather try to take it by a day and, every step you take could, um, could make it make a difference. And so I would tell anyone that has decided that they want to even consider that option of going vegan, or even like taking steps to reduce animal products in their life. I would say that I think it's important to have, um, you know, have support, whether it's family or, you know, support from friends. So be around people that do support you, right? Support your lifestyle. Uh, Don't be hard on yourself. If you mess up on a day, or maybe you give in to your temptations, uh, you know, while you should be persistent uh, with your goals, at the same time, don't punish yourself for it. I think everyone has their own journey, their path. And know that you can do it because I think, you know, if I can do it, if my, my mom can do it, my dad can do it, uh, my sister can do it, I think anyone can do it, uh, regardless of your age, where you're from, and whichever part of the world. Uh, I think it's definitely doable, but just uh, be strong-willed and be inspired. And if you ever mess up, just remind yourself of why you wanted to make that decision in the first place. And I think that will keep you going. Awesome. Fantastic. So Sunny, I also wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about some of the social media communities that you created surrounding the vegan initiative. Do you want to share any handles for any platforms? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have a, uh, you know, so we're of course on all social media. And one thing that we're doing is we're, uh, we're creating virtual community spaces And so we'll have regular events, whether it's like panel based events or we'll have open forum events uh, and we allow people to kind of come on our stage and ask questions, share their thoughts. Right. So our goal is really just to build a a community where you can ask any question you like. You can know that there's others like you that are journey as you and um, and really, you know, it's open to all. And so, uh, yeah, it's called the Jane Vegan Initiative. So if you. Uh, go on any social media platform, or even if you Google it, you'll find like our website, you'll find some of our links and that can get you connected further with, uh, with that group. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. So for any of you that are 
interested in becoming vegan or at least making steps towards that, be sure to check out the Jane Vegan Initiative. You can, as Sunny mentioned, Google it and you will find plenty of content related to it. Yep, absolutely. Sunny, I have actually a question on the, you know, just a follow up on what Kapil asked. So I think one of the retaliations that you hear from people who are trying to become vegan is that you get a lot of nutrients and vitamins from, let's say, milk and animal products. So how do you substitute that, right? How do you get rid of, like, on one hand, you can obviously get rid of milk or, let's say, yogurt, but how do you kind of substitute it with, with some other things, right? How do you kind of make up for the loss that you're having by not consuming these dairy products? What, what is your uh, response to that? Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question. And that's a very uh, common question that we'll regularly get. Uh, I think when it comes to nutrition, uh, you're going to find any, everything and anything on the internet. Like, you know, if I went, if I wanted to find an article about how pizza is healthy for you, I would probably be able to find it and I can send that over. But I think ultimately, uh, one thing that's important to note is there's nothing in animal products that you can't find in plant-based sources. So, uh, you can live a completely healthy life, um, an optimal life. Uh, on a plant-based diet, whether it is the discussion of protein, whether it's B12, uh, vitamin D, uh, these are all nutrients you can find in plant-based sources, uh, whether it's omega-3s, um, it's all there. Uh, we often will refer a few documentaries to people that are interested in learning more on the plant-based side. Uh, I think The Game Changers is probably one of my favorite uh, documentaries when it comes to uh, showing athletes around the world that have leverage the plant-based diet to, to succeed in their, uh, in their respective fields. And so in the Game Changers, we have a boxer, we have a marathon runner, we have, um, you know, Olympic weightlifter, uh, we have swimmers. I mean, they really just showed it all. And uh, we have, you know, vegans of different body sizes. So, you know, maybe there's a perception that vegans are skinny. So they showed very built, like strong buff people. Uh, at the same time, we have, um, people that are lean, more lean in nature as well. So you can honestly accomplish anything, any of your fitness goals on a plant-based diet. And um, there's definitely like the science behind it to prove it. Uh, whether it's you're eating vegan food or non-vegan food, I think it's important to, to eat healthy, to be mindful of what you're taking in. Uh, there's healthy vegan food, there's unhealthy vegan food, just as there's healthy mm -hmm. non-vegan food and unhealthy non-vegan food as well. So really, it's not the vegan itself that makes it healthy. But right. if you, um, you know, do your research and you, you make mindful choices, uh, you can definitely live a optimal life on a plant-based diet. Awesome. Yeah, that's extremely, extremely helpful. And as you said, there's always, you know, uh, substitutes that you, can, that you can take, like such as vitamin D supplements and things like that to make up for the, the loss. It's extra effort, but I think it's, it's worth it. <laughs> it's yes. worth for the for the cause and not to say there's also health benefits overall that like you don't have to like the, the human body finds it's hard to process dairy so once you kind of give up on dairy just everything is so easy and there's a lot, lot more energy to spend on other things so it makes a lot of sense yeah so i wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about the your career path that you're in right now with you know being in financial operations at goldman sachs um, I know that it was definitely a journey for you to get there. Did you want to share a little bit about the story and then like also what worked for you to, to pivot in that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, so I think it all started with my MBA. Uh, I think uh, before getting my MBA program, I was an analyst at, uh, at NRG. I was an analyst for about four years uh, when I requested a promotion. I was like, all right, let's have a meeting. I think it's time for me to have that conversation. And at that point, I realized that I kind of reached the ceiling in terms of what I can do um, at, in my particular role. I don't think there was much space for opportunity within my particular space. And I can either make two choices. One is I could pivot into another uh, department, uh, pivot to another company, or get an MBA, right? Or you know, pursue graduate education. And so um, after realizing that I'm kind of stuck in my place, I decided to go ahead and go for an MBA. I had a lot of friends that were currently in their programs, and I thought that this would be a great opportunity for me to kind of, um, you know, hone my skills, um, you know, kind of uh, acquire new skill sets, and really MB use an MBA to kind of pivot in my career. Uh, usually, people will um, pursue an MBA for two reasons. One is to either uh, get an, uh, you know, professional advance advancement in their own industry, or to completely pivot. 
And so usually people will do a full-time MBA to pivot their career. And so for me, my goal was to kind of take that. So I did a full-time MBA. And then from there, um, I saw this opportunity open up with Goldman Sachs. And, um, and it's, you know, I guess like the rest is history. So, um, you know, currently I work in global markets. And it's a very interesting space. I, I work in uh, the sales middle office. And essentially what that means is uh, when uh, we uh, execute trades, so whenever like the financial desk and the sales desk will um, execute trades, it'll kind of go through this pipeline and it'll flow downstream. And we're one of the middle office teams that ensures that every trade flows downstream. So if you kind of think about it, if someone wants to trade USD for another currency, uh, that uh, that transaction would kind of go through our, our space and we just ensure that everything is, you know, properly managed and we kind of handhold the trade, uh, if you will, and make sure it goes downstream. So that's a little bit about uh, my career path. Uh, you know, I'm continuing to learn and grow as well. I think um, I'm kind of moving more towards like the project management space. And that's kind of where I see myself um, in the near future. Okay, interesting. Yeah, thank you for walking us through that. And how do you like the environment at Goldman Sachs, right? Because one of the more well-known financial services companies. Right, right. Goldman Sachs, um, if I had to describe the culture, I think um, it's very fast-paced. Uh, you work with very, like, high-caliber, intelligent people. So I think there's something about that culture where you're always learning something new every day. So there's people that have been in this company for 20, 30 years, and every day they see something new still. And so it's definitely... Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to learn to grow and um, I, I can tell you myself that I've um, definitely transformed as a person working here just for nine months and I think mm -hmm. the amount of the wealth of knowledge and information that I've gained from this uh, experience has been um, invaluable for me. Hey fantastic. Awesome awesome so Sunny actually I, I noticed that you've uh, this not too long ago you actually wrote a paper which, on the topic of exploring the compatibility of Jainism and modern science. Was that part of your MBA program or like, how did you stumble upon this idea in the first place? And do you want to talk a little bit more about how, how did you find the idea and what was the outcome and what, what, what did you publish in the paper? Just a quick summary. Yeah, yeah, no, that was really interesting. That's something that I had uh, written quite some time with YJP, uh, like on the board at that ah, time. Okay. And, um, and yeah, I think um, I was in a period of my life where I was learning more about religion and I had, this, mm -hmm. you know, a keen interest in philosophy and religion. Mm -hmm. And um, I started, you know, one thing I realized about Jainism is uh, there's a lot of science that, I mean, there's a lot of overlap with science and religion in general. And, mm -hmm. and particularly with Jainism, this is a space that, you know, talks a lot about, uh, there's a lot of overlap with Jainism and ver various forms of science. And so whether it's uh, ecology, whether it's, um, you know, I guess, you know, I'll have to kind of go back on that paper, to be honest, to kind of remember <laughs> what I said, but uh, it, it, was, it was quite incredible. And so you know, I found okay. various uh, spaces within Jainism and connected it to, uh, to modern science. And I was able to kind of make some parallels to it. And I found it very interesting. Got it. No, sorry, I, I put you on the spot. Here. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, something I wrote a while ago, I have to think about that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have another one for you here, Sunny. Yeah. So um, our audience here is going to see in the artwork, but with at least within the YJP community, you've been dubbed as the one-man PR army. So <laughs> what I want to hear about is, you know, what is your approach to PR? And like, you know, what are some tactics that you've seen that have really worked when it comes to a marketing and PR perspective that yeah. you think other people may va find value in? And, yeah. and also, I, I think I just want to connect this with what you've done with Global Gen Network as well as Gen Vegan Initiative, because you've marked up those events really well as well. So yep. just maybe clip those together. So so for the audience here, so Sunny actually connected over 20,000 people across platforms. So that's Twitter, LinkedIn, Clubhouse, Instagram. I, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you were also on YouTube, but let's assume YouTube as well. And many other platforms. So 20,000 people is a lot of people. Yeah, no, I, I definitely love uh, the whole idea of social media management um, and PR, public relations in general. Uh, I remember the reason I joined YJP, uh, like the YJP board, was I saw that they were doing some incredible events. But every time I wanted to attend an event, I couldn't find where it was. And I realized that, you know, they were having all these incredible events, but there were no photos being taken, right? And if there's no photos, then it never happens. And so I realized that there's definitely an opportunity to to help out in that space, uh, I was a dude that, you know, of course, was on Instagram, on Snapchat all day, 
And I was like, hey, maybe I can, you know, use my uh, quote unquote skill set to kind of help, um, you know, YJP and expanding their branding and kind of reaching more people. And so um, that's kind of what got me into PR. So I, I did YGP as a, I was a public relations director of YGP for a year where I managed all their social media pages. We kind of, um, you know, organized it similar to what other Jade organizations were doing. Uh, in particular, YJA. You know, I thought, I always thought YJA was incredible at what they did. And I'm like, there's a lot of things that we can kind of emulate with YJP and connect Janes uh, around the country using these platforms. And so, uh, when it comes to graphic design, I'm definitely not uh, a graphic designer, but I learned it. I, I think I learned enough to be able to understand what looks good and what doesn't look good. And so uh, I'm definitely someone that, you know, will just sit on Canva and then just kind of make a rough design, probably look at it the next day, make some more changes and then post it. And I saw that we were getting a lot of engagement. So people were enjoying these posts, whether they were um, event flyers, whether it was like photos of actual events, whether it was, um, you know, just, I mean, there's like just a variety of different content that you could create, infographics as well, mm -hmm. or in, infographs. And, um, and yeah, I, I found that I was able to uh, add value in that way. And we kind of took that to Global J Network as well and kind of did the same thing. And so I'm always trying to find ways of creating new content to reach and engage our community. Okay. Uh, do you want to delve a little bit deeper in terms of specific techniques or tactics? And the reason I asked that is one thing I did realize is for the, the many initiatives that you did, the biggest component was the shareability of it. So people, people were inviting, it basically you got a core audience put together and then people were inviting other people to that community because of the value that it was adding to their lives. So it's like, is there anything you want to share from like a specific tactics or strategies to make something like that possible? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great question. I think making it as easy as possible for someone to join your group uh, is very important. And so I think what worked for us is we used to create, uh, when I said we used to, so we created a link tree where uh, you can just click one link and it'll kind of showcase all our social media links, um, all our latest events, all our photos, and make it very easy for someone to be able to join. So if someone sends us a message like, how do I get involved? We just send them one link and uh, they'll be able to get connected. And so I think creating a link tree, creating a way to connect all our social media platforms. So if you go on our Instagram, you would see a link to uh, our link tree, which would connect you to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, right? Um, whenever, and what we would do is we would organize all our uh, content uh, or we would uh, post our social media content based on the, the type of content it is. So if it was, for example, a, uh, a vertical video, uh, right away, you, you think of uh, Instagram Reels, you think of TikTok, uh, you think of YouTube Shorts now. And so we would post it in that sense. And uh, we would use different platforms for different things. Uh, for us, Instagram would be primarily for uh, sharing event photos, sharing quick flyers. Uh, we would think of our Facebook and LinkedIn as more of forums where people can talk underneath posts. Uh, LinkedIn is more for professional networking. So we'd allow people to share job postings or share that they're looking for a job. And we also connect Janes by uh, their, their industries, their backgrounds, their functions. And so we kind of try to tweak every platform where we're not repeating the same content, but uh, creating value in different spaces. And then also understanding that there's different demographics for every platform. So if you're trying to reach like an older audience, then uh, Facebook will probably be the way to go. If you're trying to reach millennials, Gen Z, then probably Instagram is the way to go. Uh, and really just trying to tailor our content to our audience. Yep. Awesome. And I think you described one piece really well is that you also created different communities for different purposes. So one thing that comes to mind is that you created a community surrounding, like, for example, people that are interested in marketing versus entrepreneurship versus, I, I believe you had a career search portal and then also housing search portal and then also food services. So like if you wanted to find, uh, so Tiffin service is basically like food delivery. So you had a group about that as well. So it's interesting. It's like the way, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, the way that you connected everyone together was by creating another use case, another platform for each type of use case. Right, right. If there was a need for it, we wanted to kind of cater to it. So during production, uh, which is like a period of time where a lot of people, a lot of genes are fasting, everyone's posting that, hey, where can I get food? Where can I get tiffins? And right away, we realized that, all right, there's an opportunity there. So we created a group where you can share exchange information with other people in your community on where to get uh, Jane-friendly food, for example. 
uh, for those that are interested in marketing. We saw that there's a lot of Janes in marketing and may, perhaps there's a, a need to have a space just for Janes in that space to talk to each other, to, uh, to engage in networking, uh, to help each other find jobs. And so we created a space for that. So if there was a need for it, we wanted to kind of deliver on that. Um, even uh, for Janes that, um, that, you know, immigrated from outside the United States to the United States. There's conversations about like the whole, um, you know, the visa process, H-1B process, which is a very convoluted process as a whole. And there's a lot of questions, right? So we created a group where we can support each other for those that are, you know, in the country that have questions about the process and how they can, um, you know, you know, find ways to kind of, um, you know, have the best outcomes in that process. So really we created a space for everything. And uh, our goal is just to connect, you know, connect people. And what they do with it is, um, you know, it's kind of based on trust and good faith and allow people to help each other out in that way. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. So it sounds like adding structure to an unstructured, uh, I can't think of the right word, but adding structure in a way that it seems very inclusive and value add, but at the same time connects people together. Right. Basically creating like, like combining sets of ideas and channelizing them through those groups so that people can come together and share. And that, that's how it kind of propagates uh, yeah. in the right format. I didn't put it so succinctly, but I, I think it's probably yeah. what we're trying to yeah. say. No, no, I think you got it. I think if there was a need for it, we would try to find mm -hmm. a way to bring people together. Yeah, and exactly. so uh, that our ultimate goal is to connect people in our community in ways that we haven't before. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we were really much segmented by physical borders. So uh, if you're in the South region of the United States, you would connect with people in the South region of the United States. Uh, oftentimes we're, you know, de you know, segmented by so many different things. And with the, you know, introduction of all these new technologies, we found that physical borders no longer matters. And so someone that lives in the United States could connect with someone in Canada that could connect with someone in, um, in India. Yep. And those like barriers, whether it's language barriers, whether it's like the physical barriers, no longer really mattered. And we took mm -hmm. full advantage and uh, really introduced the opportunities to connect people across borders. Yeah, absolutely. And we are actually doing the same. Transcending <laughs> 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 the borders here because we, we actually have, you know, all, the, all our sessions are recorded virtually. So all of our guests actually are recorded, you know, look, located, you know, it could be anywhere in the country. Sometimes we've recorded across different countries as well. So hundred percent agree with what you're saying. Yeah. And uh, if I'm perfectly honest, some of the stuff we're doing is inspired by Sunny. So if you guys are looking for a social media <laughs> consultant or a PR agent, uh, you probably want to give Sunny a call. <laughs> There we yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. All right. So, Sunny, our next segment is rapid fire, as the name suggests. You know, first thing that comes to mind. Um, let me know when you're ready, and we, we'll get going from there. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Other, first one: tea or coffee? Uh, coffee. Okay. Mountains or beaches? Mountains. Okay, interesting. Uh, morning person or night owl? Uh, definitely night owl. <laughs> okay what's your favorite comfort food comfort food uh i, I would say taco bell but i'm sure other people have said that before but uh i'll say pizza okay no pizza is good pizza is uh, <laughs> the best what's your favorite yeah. virtue in others virtue in others i think empathy ah <laughs> <That makes sense. laughs> yeah. okay what's your biggest pet peeve biggest pet peeve um that's a good question what makes me mad? Um, I think uh, people that are very, um, no, that's not good. I, I think type A people that are too type A is, is a little tough for me. So I think a little bit more laid back uh, like the people I enjoy. I so. <laughs> got it, got it. Yeah, and I've always uh, always seen you smile. So you have like a calm demeanor. So I can, you know, I could see why, why that would be the case. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But there's an importance so, of type A people, by the way, in every group. It's always oh, good to have yeah, a yeah. handful. Yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure. What's your secret superpower? Secret superpower. Um, that's a good question as well. Uh, I enjoy playing video games. So it's not really a superpower, but. Okay. Not too bad. <laughs> What's the longest you've gone uh, in one sitting? Oh, 
hours, probably hours. Yeah, definitely like <laughs> half a day just sitting on there, you know, just playing, playing away, you know. So, yeah, I can definitely. Um, there's no limit to that. <laughs> any any specific game or type uh, of game? I am definitely a Halo person. So there's Got a lot it. of Call of Duty people, but I play Halo. I grew up on it, so that's definitely my game. <laughs> awesome. Okay, bro, that's not that's not vegan, bro. No, I was kidding. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the aliens. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, what's a superpower you wish you had? Uh, if I had to say superpower, I wish I had. I think would be pretty cool. That'd be great. Yeah, I think you know, see the world from a different perspective. We have quite. I think that's a that's a good one. That's a, also a very common one, like teleportation. Teleportation. Uh, I teleportation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I You're right. We, we get those two a lot. <laughs> teleportation <laughs> <Right>. and bike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So actually, that's it on the rapid fire. But on the next question is, you know, what's in what's been your biggest accomplishment in the last one or two years? Uh, biggest accomplishment. Um, I think going back to uh, my graduate program, that was definitely one of the very challenging times of my life. Um, you know, they create these programs to uh, kind of push you. Uh, push you physically, push you mentally, uh, you know, of course, push you academically. And, um, and definitely accomplishing that was definitely uh, a, you know, a huge accomplishment for my life. And so really grateful for that. I think I was really grateful for that experience and uh, definitely something that I would put high on my list of accomplishments. Got it. You know, the, absolutely. And part of it was also virtual, right? Because it, it was during the pandemic. So yeah, I got hit with it. the pandemic halfway through my program. And so we were physical and then it suddenly switched to virtual. And so, uh, you know, we had professors teaching us through their iPhone, you know, and it was, it was <laughs> insane, but we got through it. <laughs> got it. Awesome. So, Sunny, uh, given all of that, what's next for you? What's next for me? And so um, that, is a, that is a good question. I think um, I take every day one step at a time. I think um, I'm really excited to visit home um, in Houston. I'm actually uh, planning to uh, move to Dallas in the coming months. And so really excited about that as well. And I think that'll definitely be a next uh, stage in my life as well. So um, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's what I'm looking forward to. Okay, fantastic. Okay, what about professionally i know you've said transitioning over to project management but yep. are you thinking about going more into the jvi stuff the jv initiative stuff or kicking that off once you're settled back in dallas or you know outside of outside of the work and the the new location is there anything else you're looking into at the moment yeah yeah i mean there's um all these exciting initiatives that are happening with the with the jane vegan initiative and the global j network uh we have a group we have a team behind us that are working so hard that are so passionate and we have so many like kind of project ideas that we want to act on. So I think in the coming months, uh, we have a lot of things to look forward to there. So really excited about that as well. Okay. Awesome. All right. Cool. Fantastic. All right. So Sunny, I think we are coming close to our discussion here, but before we wrap, I, this is the last question I, I'd like to ask all of our guests. So do you have any recommendations for our listeners? And a recommendation could be anything, a book or a movie podcast, anything that, really stuck with you or inspired you in some way? I had to uh, give advice to your audience and just to people mm -hmm. in general. I think stepping out of your comfort zone is such an important thing. Uh, I think mm -hmm. time flies by. And uh, one thing that you'll learn in life is that if you step out of your comfort zone and you do something that you may not be comfortable with, uh, you'll never regret it. So rarely do you regret doing something that you're not prepared for. And it's usually something that will allow you to grow um, and change as a person. So uh, I'll say step yeah. out of your comfort zone, yeah. I, I, I wanna say that you may regret it in the moment sometimes, but never looking back, <laughs> right? right? Somebody right. said it in, in one of the discussions the other end, it's really, I found it funny, but also it's true. Um, in, in some cases, not always, mostly yeah. it will be a rewarding experience, even in the moment as well. But yeah, I'm gonna yeah. leave with that. Yeah, Okay. I, well, this was an awesome discussion. Thanks so much for joining, Sunny. Um, I did want to ask one last question to you, and that is if you had any questions for us. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm loving what both of you are doing. And thank you for having me. This was, you know, such a great experience. And, um, and I learned a lot from you all as well. Like, even just the questions that you asked uh, allowed me to kind of introspect um, on the spot, which I thought was great. And so uh, questions for you all. Uh, what are your plans for 
uh, upcoming events, whether it's um, upcoming speakers, as well as where you see the, the podcast going in the future. Okay, sure. Um, Deepan, would you like me to take it or would you like to go for this yeah. one? Go for it. I know you have lots of ideas. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. So today's episode is actually the first experimentation of this, but we want to go into video. So we've done a little bit of experimentation with it with some shout out reels that we've done. So basically it's from episode nine onwards, every guest that we've got on at the tail end of the recording, we've done a shout out video where they introduce themselves and say, welcome to the Your Life Unfiltered podcast. I think it's like a nice creative touch to just get some video content. So we're going to definitely continue with the shout out videos, but we also want to take in snips, snippets to post across TikTok, YouTube shorts, um, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. So definitely want to go on a video. From a guest perspective, we are looking at a diversity of guests, but we're not thinking bigger and bolder types of guests. So we're going to have a mix, right? We're always going to have people that have a lot of diverse perspective, regardless of the audience size that they may be that they may be controlling. But we also want to get higher caliber guests because we want to get as many eyeballs as possible. So over the last month or two, what we've been really focused on is trying to get a little bit of relevancy. So I'm not sure, Sunny, if you've had a chance to tune in, but we actually brought on a handful of guests from the, sh- the hit Netflix TV show, Indian Matchmaking. I saw that. That was yeah. incredible. So that was a great way to get a little bit of eyeballs and attention on us. So we got a little bit of traction from that, but now we want to take some of the traction we got, some of the following we've obtained and take it to the next level. And so we're now bringing a little bit, um, quite a few heavy hitter names into the mix. So when I say heavy hitter, I'm talking about people like that ha- command larger following. So one example is a, I'm not going to drop any names here because I want to build up suspense, but we have someone that basically ran for Miss USA and did very well in that competition. And so we, we've we gotten interest from that person to, to join the podcast. So we're going to bring someone of that caliber on. We also have a basically twin singers, twin singers that are R&B singers that have multiple platinum albums. Uh, we're trying to, we got interest from them and I've scheduled to do a recording them in November. So trying to get, trying to get in people like that onto the podcast. So that's, yeah. that's what's next for the moment. Um, a lot of work to do. We're still trying to master how to do a lot of the stuff that we're doing, but so far it's been going well and we're looking forward to see what's next. Yeah. And just to add to what Ketul said in terms of the guests also looking at the diversity, right? So we are, one of our missions is to, bring diverse perspectives together on people from different backgrounds so that we can obviously talk about their journey, but also learn from them in the process. And same for the listeners who might be looking to learn from them. So looking at diverse people, so just to add to what Ketul said, we are also bringing in a radio jockey who basically is you know going live in front of, let's say like 20, 25 million people every single day. And this is in India, right? So it's a huge audience commanded over there then we are bringing a fitness trainer who's also an nba coach uh talk about you know the basics of fitness and what people can learn from so on and so forth so you get the idea but really honing on that diverse aspect of it as well is one of our next uh steps here i, I think that's incredible i uh, really excited to see uh what both of you come up with and um it sounds like this incredible uh it is an incredible vision for this podcast and the value that's going to bring to others. So I'm really excited to see more. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for tuning in. This was a fantastic episode. Thank you again, Sunny, for taking the time to join us here. Um, I don't have any more questions on my end. So if you guys have no more questions, you know, thank you all for listening and have a great rest of your day. Thank you everyone. Wonderful. Thank you so much.